Magi are the Christmas visitors that we're looking at this morning. For more than 30 years, Howard Carter searched the deserts of Egypt. Uh, Something that most people told him did not exist. The tomb of Tutankhamun. He was told repeatedly, all the treasures have been found. There's no more to discover. But he plodded on in the Valley of the Kings. After five years, without any success, his main sponsor, Lord Carmarthen of England, pulled out his sponsorship. So he was out there with no hope, no money, just plodding away with a belief that the tomb of Tutankhamun was there to be discovered. And then in November of 1922, during his final season of work, they found a staircase of the tomb of Ramesses VI. He sent a cable which read these words, At last, have made a wonderful discovery in the valley, a magnificent tomb with seals intact. And Carter had discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, the greatest archaeological discovery, some say, that has ever been found. Inside, they found 400 shapti, little inscription tablets. They found over 5,000 objects in the tomb. It would take Carter and his team eight years or more to remove it and catalogue it all. But most importantly for him, they found a complete body. The royal mummy, untouched after its burial. The only one that's ever been found untouched and complete. And Howard Carter was driven by a firm belief, there is treasure to be found. Don't give up. There is treasure to be found. Don't give up. And Carter found it. And the story of the wise men, the Magi, is a story of adventure. Unsure of where, how, why, what. But they too believe there is treasure to be found. Even though a lot of folks would have said, give up, don't bother. They plodded on. They plodded on. And we're familiar with the aspects of this story. There is hardly a Christmas card of the nativity that doesn't include the shepherds. I would imagine all around the country today, the carol, We Three Kings, is being sung. Apart from here, because I forgot to include it. (laughs) But in case you didn't know the story of the three kings, let me give it you in a 60-second summary. But listen carefully or you'll miss it. This is the story. Three kings came to see the king and asked him where the new king was born. But the first king told the three kings that he didn't know where the second king was. His advisors looked in the Bible, but not in one or two kings, and found that the second king was to be born in Bethlehem. So the first king told the three kings to find the second king and tell him, the first king where the second king was because the first king thought the second king was one king too many but when the three kings found the second king they realized he was actually the number one king the king of kings and that compared with him the other king and all other kings were really no kings at all so we can all go home now can't we we've got the story Now, the story of the wise men and their gifts is a story shrouded in mystery. From tradition, we think we know all the facts. But actually, when you look at what the Bible says, mystery is written all over it. For example, how many were there? We don't know. Tradition says three because there were three gifts. But one king could have just brought three gifts if he was on his own with his entourage. Or there could have been 20 of them, but they came in packs of 10 and presented one gift. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Where did they come from? We don't know. How long did their journey take? Yeah, we don't know. What were their names? Uh, We don't know. It wasn't until the 5th century they were given the name Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, I think it is, isn't it? But that was 500 years after these events happened. The wise men just seemed to show up mysteriously and then disappear mysteriously. Now from the Greek word translated magi, 
We call them wise men, or tradition calls them kings. The word magi, we get our word magician. Magician. But these weren't like Dynamo or David Blaine, you know, doing tricks and illusions. Not that type of mission, a magician at all. The word magi in Bible times referred to those who were experts in philosophy, medicine, and natural science. In Bible days, you didn't Google, sorry, you didn't search Google for an answer to a question. You know, I'm so old, I remember when Google didn't exist. You had to go down the library and pick up books and find your answers in books. These days, we have instant information in search engines like Google. You didn't do that in Bible times. And if you were a king, if you were important, you had people who were your magi, your walking encyclopedias. If you want an example of someone like that, think of Daniel in the Old Testament, he who was in the den of lions and kept safe. The Babylonians invaded his country. Daniel and others were taken off into slavery, captivity. This is what the Bible says. That the Babylonians selected only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. So I would have been taken. Some of you guys would have been left behind. Okay? Those who are well-versed in every branch of learning are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So they took the elite the best, the brains and the beauty, they took them away, they put them in their libraries, they crammed them full of information. And then when the king had a problem that needed solving, bring on the Magi. What's the answer to this? And their walking Google search engines would come and give them the answer to their solutions. That's the Magi. The Magi. Someone has said if the Magi existed today, they would be called astronomers. Astronomers, not astrologers. There's a big difference. Astrologers are those who claim to know the future by reading the stars and the tarot cards and horoscopes, etc., etc. But notice it's not the stars that influence this baby, it's the baby who influenced the star. It's the reverse. And this text makes, makes, the text makes it very clear that the Magi appear to be astronomers in that they looked at the stars for guidance. So they're not astrologers. They were men of science, men of information, not soothsayers and fortune tellers. The Magi, the Magi. And there's three things I want us to note about them this morning. Here's the first one. A wise man's journey is one of faith. A wise man's journey is one of faith. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star, notice that, his star, not just a star, we saw his star in the east. Now the description of the star in this little passage would suggest that it didn't kind of hover above them like a UFO and wherever they went it just naturally guided them. It was the past tense. We saw his star in the east. Had it been in the present test, they would have said we see his star in the west as well. But they never said that. They saw it and then it disappeared. And then they saw it again over the house or the stable where Jesus was. In this case, the house, because they arrive when Jesus is a child. And we're not told that the star guided them every step of the way. They saw it, it disappeared, and then it appeared again later on. Verse 2 calls it his star. The actual Greek word is radiance or light. I don't want to spoil your Christmas traditions. It may not have actually been a physical star. It may just have been light that God put in the sky or over the house for these folks to focus in on. Or it may have been a star to start with to get them in the right direction and then a light above the house. What the Bible calls God's glory, the Shekinah, as it appeared in the tabernacle and other places in the Bible. So we don't know. We don't know. But a wise man's journey is one of faith. Just think for a moment and ask yourself the question, what would prompt someone to leave the safety, the security, and the comfort of their home to go on a long, dangerous journey in the hope you might find something? Well, lots of answers. Romance. Romance. People go on long journeys for romance. I've got a friend who would go... 
uh, regularly from here up to Scotland just to meet his loved one. When I was uh, going out with Penny, I used to make a, a four-hour trip to where she was and then four hours back again in one day just to spend a few hours with her. People go on journeys out of love. People meet online. When I was in Moldova a few years ago, I was taken to this little village. They had no electricity in the house. They had no running water, no gas. The water came from a well. They lit oil lamps. And I chatted to two, how can I put it, two senior ladies. And uh, as I sat there and chatted to these two ladies, I was trying to make conversation. And then through my translator, one lady pointed at the other lady and said, she's just got engaged. I, I was shocked. So I said, what, to a man in the village? And the answer was, no, someone she met online. <laughs> modern times, modern times. But obviously not a local. But they will make that journey to spend time together. So romance is a reason people make long and dangerous journeys. Wealth. When I was a kid, my, my, I loved the Tarzan films. You know, the, the old Johnny Weissmuller, the black and white Tarzans and... This, you can tell why my kids are so happy. For a treat, one Christmas, I said, right, every day this week, we're having curly cinema. We're going to draw the curtains. We're going to pull the settee up right close to the telly. We've got our popcorn, and we're going to go for a box set of these Tarzan movies day by day, one a day. And the kids were up for it. We've done it with other box sets. The trouble is, when I put the DVD on, they said, oh, no, Dad, it's broken. I said, what do you mean? I said, look, it's in black and white. I said, no, 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 it was made in black and white. No, no, it's broken. We want it in colour. I said, you can't have it in colour. It's black. Oh, do we have to watch it? But if ever you watched those Tarzan films, and we did watch it, we did enjoy it. Um, and Johnny Weissmuller, definitely the best Tarzan ever. That's by the way. But uh, if ever you watched those Tarzan stories, the plot was always the same. People came from the West to Africa to find the gold or the diamonds in the jungle. And they attacked the natives and Tarzan kicked them out. Same story, different scenario, slightly every week. But people made a long journey. Why? Because they were after the treasure, just like Howard Carter. So wealth, romance, adventure. Why does Bear Grylls go on long journeys? For the adventure of it. But I'm not impressed with Bear Grylls. I mean, he, come on, if he was any good, he'd take a packed lunch with him, wouldn't he? Why has he got to eat all these strange foods? Here's another reason people go on a long journey. Faith. Faith. These Magi were men of faith. There are people all over the world today, we call them missionaries, have gone in faith and are supported by faith. And they're there for a reason. They believe God has called them to serve a particular group of people or community. Now look again at their insightful and probing question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews. They didn't say, has a king been born? No, where? They are confident this child has been born. There's absolutely no doubt in their mind. Their faith is not blind. They are confident a child has been born. I, I, can you imagine when they were leaving back home, wherever they came from, and the neighbour said, uh, going on a journey, boys? Yep, good. Uh, where are you going? Ah, oh, we don't know. We're kind of following the stars. Oh, great. Um, how far is your journey? Uh, we don't know. Could be a while. How long are you going to be gone? Mm. Uh, can you imagine their neighbours saying, well, for wise men, you don't seem very wise. But their journey was one of faith, not blind faith. Where did they get their information from? Well, if they came from Babylon... If they came from Persia, Iran, if they came from the uh, Arabian desert, that part of the world, they may well have come across Jewish slaves and captives, like Daniel, who when they were taken, took with them their scrolls and their literature, prophecies about a baby to be born, his star rising in the east, all these prophecies. Daniel could have added to the literature of those people and explained to them. So they went with their bases in the scriptures. That's a suggestion. But a wise man's journey is one of faith. Did you know there are two types of faith? The Bible says there is saving faith and there is experimental faith. Saving faith comes first. That's what fits us for heaven. Every Christian is saved by faith. No one will stand before God and say, didn't I do well? 
The Bible says it's not by works. It's not by church attendance. It's not by charitable deeds. It's not by anything we do that gets us right with God. It is by grace. It's all of God's doing through faith. Faith is the vehicle. And when we respond to that and we say, God, I've got nothing to offer you but my sin, that's where you start. So we are saved by faith. And then experimental faith kicks in, and that's what fits us for earth. So saving faith gets us to heaven. And experimental faith is how we live here on earth. Saving faith is the result of trusting the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Experimental faith is how we follow Jesus day by day. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't mean we walk blindly, but our daily living is to please God. Saving faith is intangible. It cannot be measured. Some people got saved and their faith was as small as a mustard seed and others got Saved and their faith was as large as a mountain. But actually, it's not how much faith you've got, it's where you put it. You know, when we go on, years ago, we went on holiday as a family when Kathy was very little. She'd be about four or five. And we're in an aeroplane, and I am not the best flyer. I don't like the takeoff, I don't like the landing, and I'm not keen on the bit in the middle. Okay, but I fly because it gets me from A to B. And we're in the plane, and the stewardess is doing all her exits and stuff, and it's all gone quiet. And Kathy knows I'm not a good flyer, so she grabbed hold of my hand, and in a child's voice, in the quiet of the aeroplane, she said, my dad is scared of flying, but I'm holding his hand, so he'll be all right. And you could hear the sniggers and the laughter and the ah of everyone else, and I was the one who sat there going very, very red. Now, if, like me, you are a nervous flyer, or if you are a veteran, a seasoned flyer, it makes no difference about your feelings. What counts is the pilot and the plane. That's what makes a difference. And when it comes to faith in God, whether you've got small faith or big faith, it's not important. It's where you place it. Is it in the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ? That's what saves us. Nothing else the Bible says. So saving faith is intangible. You can't measure a person's faith. Experimental faith is tangible. You see it outworked in someone's life. Hebrews chapter 11 is a whole chapter of people commended because they did something for God. Abraham did this. Sarah did that. Rahab did that. You can visibly see their faith in action. So saving faith is passive. Experimental faith is active. The old hymn summarizes it best. That says this, I cannot save my soul by works for that my Lord has done. That's saving faith. But I will work like any slave for love of God's dear son. That's experimental faith. We don't earn our salvation, but out of gratitude we serve the Lord. And people should see that as we walk by faith. So like the wise men of old, faith is still the key ingredient in discovering how to follow Jesus. So a wise man's journey is one of faith. Secondly, a wise man's journey is one of worship. When the wise men came on their journey, it was for the purpose of discovering this baby, this child, and they brought gifts of gratitude, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. And you've heard the the Christmas renditions of how children have said, Gold, myrrh, and Frankenstein, or gold, myrrh, and Frankie sent this. All sorts of variations. But the Bible tells us what those gifts were. And these gifts have a lot of symbolism associated with them, as we know. But verse 2, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? They recognized him as a king. That's what scared Herod. Herod was in his position because of money. He had bribed, he had purchased that position by finance. And when they hear one born king of the Jews, here's the natural Jew who should have be on the throne. So Herod now has a rival. He's purchased his position. He doesn't deserve it. This baby does. That's why Herod is against him. Because he's got a legit, legitimate claim to his throne. And when the wise men come to worship... And that's what they say. We saw his star and we have come to worship him. They realize there is more to worship than gifts. 
True worship involves sacrifice. True worship involves a cost. Anything that costs us nothing is worth nothing and does nothing. So what was the price of their worship? Well, first of all, they've given themselves a journey of possibly two years or more. Secondly, travel was not comfortable. They didn't fly. They may have come by camel, though no camel is mentioned. But it was a long, dangerous journey. They were open to attack by bandits. They sacrificed their careers back home. While they were out on their journey, someone else was replacing them. Would they get their old jobs back when they returned? We don't know. Someone said if they came from Persia or the Arabian desert, their journey was 1,400 miles. If they came from Babylon, which many people believe they did, it was 600 plus miles. The Pony Express, their riders used to do 75 miles a day, changing horses every 5 to 20 miles. So this was a long, long, tricky, difficult journey. But that was part of their worship. It's like the woman who was a missionary in the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific, Pacific Islands. And a little boy gave her a seashell as a present. And she knew that these shells could only be found on the far side of the island. It was like a half a day's walk there and back. And she said to the little boy, did you go and get this yourself or did someone give it to you? And the boy said, no, no, I walked to the other side of the island. I found the shell and I brought it for you. And she said, God, that was a long journey. And the little boy said this, long walk, part of the gift. Long walk, part of the gift. These folks sacrificed a sign of their worship. And did you notice two things? First of all, their worship was humble. They bowed down, verse 11 says. They bowed down. No one comes before God in pride. We all come on a level playing field. We all bow down before Jesus. You know, the, Francis Chan, there's a brilliant quote by Francis Chan. He's an American preacher. And uh, at the end of a service, he was standing by the door. And as folks passed out, they were saying, you know, thank you for your sermon. Thank you for your word. You always tell the visitors, they say, nice speech. And uh, so people are filing out. And then one of the locals said, uh, Pastor, I did not like the songs that we sang this morning in the service. And Francis Chan said, that's not a problem. We weren't singing them to you. Hey, worship is not about you, it's about him. And these cows bow down, they come humbly. It's not about them, it's about the child. And then secondly, worship is spontaneous. They open their treasures before him. They had prepared gifts, and now was that opportunity to present them. And they did it willingly, willingly. What is it that we bring to the Lord. You know, if you want poetry to answer that, there's a carol that says, what can I give him? Poor as I am. If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? I give him my heart. Well, poetry, that's fine. It's nice. A little bit sugary, but it's okay. What does it mean practically? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 12 verse 1, you know what your spiritual act of worship is? To present your bodies as a daily offering. Hey, we live daily for the Lord. That's our worship. That's how people know we mean business. That's what God looks for. We present our bodies daily. That is our spiritual act of worship. Holy, separate from the world, living for God. And then thirdly, a wise man's journey is one of change. Verse 12, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. They came one way, they left another. After they met Jesus, they couldn't go back the same way they came. And that's true of anyone. You know, Charles Spurgeon used to have the biggest church in London, uh, I don't know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, one of the greatest preachers is called the Prince of Preachers. People just queued up to hear Spurgeon preach. And he saw thousands of people converted, come to faith. And Spurgeon tells the story that one day he's walking through the streets of London and there's a vagrant in a doorway, sleeping rough, a drunkard. And Spurgeon stopped and looked at him and the man looked up and said, it's you, it's Mr. Spurgeon, it's Mr. Spurgeon. And Spurgeon said, yes it is. 
He said, I'm one of your converts, as he drank on his whiskey or whatever alcohol he had. And Spurgeon looked at him and said, yes, you are. You're one of my converts. You're obviously not one of the Lord's. Hey, when we encounter Jesus, there's a change. The old is gone, the new has come, the Bible says. Christ makes a difference. Now, none of us are perfect. We're all works in progress. But I should be more like Christ this year than I was last year and the year before. And I came to faith when I was about 17. And you might think I've got some rough edges, and I have, but I'm certainly not the person I used to be. I'm not the person I want to be. But there's a change going on as I walk with the Lord in the light of his word. The great, let me finish with this quote. The great Scottish preacher, Alexander McLaren, once wrote these words. We may have as much as God as we will. We may have as much of God as we will. Christ puts the key to the treasure chamber in our hand and bids us to take all we want. If a man is admitted into the bullion vault of a bank and told to help himself and comes out with one cent, whose fault is it that he's poor? Christ offers us, hey, forgiveness from the past, his help and the Holy Spirit in the present, and hope for the future. Will we take it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these wise men, for their faith, for their worship, for the change that we see in the story. Help us to glean some truth from it, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.